by you all this morning. Very good. So nice to be here. Um, yes, well, I had a psalm, which I can't find now. Anyway, basically, it talked about how sometimes in life we feel like we're slipping. Um, it talks about how sometimes anxiety can overwhelm us. Um, fears that we've heard about this morning in the songs. And, um, um, and you know, I was just thinking about how sometimes in life we do feel a bit like that, don't we? We feel like we're slipping. We might be slipping a little bit spiritually. We might be slipping a little bit uh, in our habits. We might be slipping. We feel like we're slipping in our health, our relationships, all kinds of areas of our lives. Um, the, the psalm, and we'll, I'll find it before the end of the service. And then, no, sorry. Um, is that, you know, God will never leave us or forsake us, as Emma was talking about. But in relationship to the slipping, I also just wanted to quickly read um, from Habakkuk. And it talks about how God wants to um, give us hind feet. Hind feet on high places. It says in Psalm 91, uh, sorry, um, in Habakkuk, um, sorry, I'm a bit good to read this morning. Chapter 3 and verse 19. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. And, and I was just thinking in relationship to the slipping, um, you know, God wants to give us those hind feet. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Uh, God created the, this particular type of deer that can uh, navigate the very high mountainous tracks, you know, in places like Nepal and things like that. Incredibly high altitudes that they go to to feed. And tiny little tracks. And, and God has made them in a way that they have these special hooves, these special feet that can grip these paths and stop them from falling and slipping. And, um, you know, we're a bit like that sometimes, aren't we? We get so concerned about what's happening down here in the valley, about what's happening on the ground, that we forget to look up. We forget to exercise the hind feet that God has given us. And he's given us hind feet in the fact uh, that, that we can choose to look up in every situation. We can choose to navigate the high places regardless of what is happening in our lives. That we make a choice to look up, to access God's promises, to declare uh, God's word over our lives, amen, and over our situations. Uh, and, you know, I've come across a lot of people lately who are slipping. You know, the whole world at the moment is on a bit of a slippery slope, isn't it? You know, there's lots of things happening in the natural that can cause us anxiety, that can cause us to feel like we're slipping a bit, we're losing the grip, things are changing too quickly, we don't know what's ahead of us. But we have to absolutely focus on looking up and, and, and looking at God's perspective. Amen? Instead of looking down, looking at the facts, looking at the circumstances around us, and we start to slip. We start to get overwhelmed sometimes, don't we? Yeah. We, we have to encourage ourselves that we, we will feed ourselves on the good things yeah. of yeah. God's oh. word, those things that are good and lovely and true and righteous and uplifting, yeah. and try and stay away from a lot of that negative stuff. It's very good. Yeah? yeah? Not yeah. constantly on our phones and on Facebook and looking for all the latest data and records and numbers and all that kind of stuff. You know, we want to stay informed, but we don't want to become obsessed with all that stuff. And so many people are. And so, you know, let's just really um, try and be like those those deer. Remember that we feel like we're slipping a little bit, that we're losing our grip, that we're just, you know. Uh, I, yesterday, Gary and Joy took me on this beautiful walk up the mountain, up the hill there behind them. And I, I was slipping. You know, I felt like well, I had to break the tree trunks. <laughs> I had to hold on to Gary on a couple of occasions. You know, it was wet and it was a bit slippery. So even in the natural, you know, we can slip. Um, but how much more spiritually if we're not aware? We have to keep, keep um, you know, being aware. And, um, yeah. Oh, God bless you. Keep going.
Great to see everyone again. Lovely to be back here at Freedom Church in uh, Waihi Beach. Um, and, and really, this is uh, such a great church that God has raised up here um, and uh, that you have helped develop along with uh, your wonderful pastors, with, uh, of course, with Ryan and Emma leading the way. Um, but this church um, always brings a joy to my heart because... Um, ever since, well, we, I was coming here as a little child, swimming, you know, in the holiday seasons, and then we started to come regularly when bro uh, my brother-in-law, Gary and Joy, um, when they moved here. How long ago was that? 33. 33 years ago. So we've been coming a lot since then, oh, yeah. just to spend time with this awesome family. And we had, we arrived Friday so we could take a big long walk along the beach and Gary took me mountain biking uh, up the track, some of them he's made. Uh, he was going super fast. Oh, he's not, I wasn't meant to say that, You're not, they're not legal ones. But, uh, but uh, we had a great time. We love coming here. But you know one of the reasons why we love coming here? Because we actually believe in what God has been doing with this church. We really do. And uh, it's a, a real joy to have the relationship with this uh, lovely couple, a man and woman of God, and to see what you guys are doing. Um, this is the best thing that we've seen since coming here 33 years, Freedom Church. Yeah? We would, uh, we would lament with Gary, what, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And we know that it's not only reaching the beach, we know it's also touching people in Waihe and Caddy. Uh, so uh, it's just great to see what God is doing. Amen. 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 This is a this is a great couple. Um, this is an awesome couple, and I just felt like the Lord just gave me something really simple um, for you. Um, and I just felt like the Lord was saying for you, Emma, that uh, He's just going to download in another level things about situations and people that will be very private. In other words, it won't be for public consumption. It will be for an individual situation, but he's going to, and I saw like A4 pieces of paper filled up with just direct revelation from God, showing what they have in terms of their need, what they've been through, and the answers within that as well. So this will be a private thing, and when you sit down to share what God has un un downloaded to you, it's going to be as if there is a third person in the room, which we know there is, but it's going to be like Jesus is sitting there with you and helping you to help that person through whatever they're going through. I felt that it was for some people that are going through some incredibly hard things, but also it's going to be for people who are not necessarily going through some really hard things, but it's just going to help them with their roadmap in God. And it's just going to be at another a level that your heart desires. But I just felt like it was private consumption. It wasn't public. So it's just going to be more of that one-on-one -on -one presence of God. With Ryan, I just felt like, you know, there's definitely an apostolic gifting upon your life. And of course, it's upon here and it's upon, upon you. It's upon the church that there's an apostolic gifting. Um, and that, that's, that's spiritual fathering. Uh, it's breakthrough. The apostolic brings a breakthrough. The Bible says the apostle is the foundation. The apostle and prophet are the foundation. Not the cornerstone like Jesus but the foundation of the church. The church is built on the foundation of the apostle and the prophet. So that's scripture. And so this is foundational. You're a builder. God's given you a building anointing. And that's the apostolic too. You know, Paul describes it as a master builder, like a wise master builder. The word architect comes from that word. Architecton, an architect. And that's why you're carrying this. That's why you can't get away from it. That's why it's there even when you want to give it away. And uh, give it up and whatever, it's there when it's tough times or good times. And, and you need to, I just felt like the Lord was saying, you just relax in that a bit. Relax in that because that functions not because of what you do. That's a gift. That's why all the glory goes to God. Because it's come straight from God. And things will happen that won't happen without that gift. That, so, yeah, they wouldn't happen if there wasn't that gift present. And he wants you to relax in that a bit and, and just see what he can do to help you uh, fulfill what he's showing you. Amen? It's strong, it's there, and it not only impacts the beach area, it impacts Waihi, 
beyond where you're reaching out to Karikati and beyond where you've got a heart for even other areas of this part of the Bay of Plenty. Amen? Amen. No. Is that alright for the $20 you gave me? <laughs> Imagine what I could have said if you'd given me 50 <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we just pray. We are enjoying your presence this morning. Lord, we love the way that this church just um, embraces the community, embraces the people, embraces people of all ages that we see manifest in this church. And we just pray this morning, what I share, top of what's already been shared, what we have already been ministered to, on top of what Glenda shared, Lord, that will just bring uh, encouragement, it will bring challenge, it will bring some insight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 There will be some really challenging things in the thing that I share this morning. So um, I make no apologies. I just give you a warning, that's all. Um, and some of it is like what well, the, the flash words that they use these days. It's a meta-narrative. That means it's big picture stuff. And it's around priorities of the kingdom of God and big picture things. So the meta-narrative. And uh, I'm going to start off. It just goes through from from wider to, to back to local, uh, but we start off on the thought of mission. So, um, you know, we want to try and achieve a balance in our lives. Is that right? And it's not really done by an allocation, an allocation of a percentage of our time. We can't suddenly do 20% here and 10% here and 15% over there and 40% here. This Life's not like that. Is that right? It's not a balance sheet. It's not a... Uh, something that can be just divided up like that, although sometimes we might be tempted to. Um, it's not mathematical, it can't be scripted. Um, and, but there is, so because there are times when you actually have to exclusively focus your time and attention on, uh, attention on something in particular. For example, if you're on a missions trip for two weeks, so Gary and I have had the, the joy of going on missions trips all over the place. And uh, when you're there, that's your focus, is that right? He can't be worrying about, oh, I'm going to do that light switch in that woman's cabin. <laughs> he can't be thinking like that. And I can't be thinking, oh, I wonder if they, oh, I forgot to get somebody to help lead the prayer I've, I've just got to be focused on what I'm doing at that time, on that missions trip. It might be a couple of weeks, two or three or four weeks, whatever. Uh, there are other things where you might have a family member that's in hospital or a great need that's become into your, come into your life and circumstance. You can't say, well, I can only give 30% of my time to that. You don't say that, do you? That gets your whole attention and your focus at that time. So balance is not necessarily a even dividing up of a percentage of your time. It's whatever God has put in your plate to do at that time. And as was shared this morning, it's to do it with all your heart. Is that right? And where that focus needs to be, it can shift because of circumstances. So there's no formula. But what I want to give you is some of the big picture stuff that is needs to be included. It does need to be part of our lives, individually and part as a church. So I'm just going to grab, where did I put my Bible? Here it is. I grab my Bible. If you could turn with me to Mark 11. to 17. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. Okay, so in the life and the ministry of, of Jesus, this is where he gets the, the roughest and the angriest. Okay? Is this passage? Is this it? This is where he gets the most upset. He gets the most upset with his own countrymen, with his own people, with the Jewish people. And people have jumped on this scripture 
and they've said things like, you are not allowed to have a Coke machine in the foyer, you know. You're not allowed to sell, you know, cakes. You're not allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. And they've kind of misinterpreted. They've missed it completely. They've thought that there should be no sign of any commercial activities associated with the church. But that's missing the point. What's happening here is that they are in the court of the Gentiles. So this is a part of the temple that was specifically set aside for mission. This was set aside so that non-Jewish people could find out about God. So what they had done is they had replaced it with the money changers. People that were doing something legitimate, but it had to be done, should have been done outside. Okay, because people had to change the money. Doves and, you know, sacrifices. They had to buy those things, but it could have been done outside of that. All right? So it's not about whether we've got a Coke machine in the foyer. It's about whether we've got a place of missions. Yeah. And this is about the Abrahamic covenant. This is because Abraham was told you'll be a blessing. You're going to be blessed to be a blessing to all the nations. And so they put the court of the Gentiles in there to fulfill that. And then what did they do? They forgot about it. They replaced it. They put all this other stuff happening. And so missions lost its place out of the Abrahamic covenant that God had spoke, spoken to Abraham about. So we need to understand that this is, Jesus is saying, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And you have replaced that and you've turned it into a place of merchandise. And uh, people, you know, buying and selling, even a den of robbers, he describes it. Uh, and so his house is what? If he says my house, what does he mean in our context? He says my church. Is that right? It's the church. The house of God is the church. Everyone say, say to somebody next to you, we are the house of God. Yeah. Amen? And uh, we have to understand that context because too many people can regard missions as like some little periphery. You know, there's three or four people, they meet every few months and they have, a, you know, they pray for Uganda. So, and you know, some of them knit things and sell things and you know, markets and things and raise a little bit of money for mission. So it can be very much on the periphery. But Jesus is saying, my house, my church, will be a house of prayer for all nations. Amen? And so it's central. It's not periphery. It's central to what the house of God should be about. And Jesus gets the most ticked off in this particular thing that we see him in any other. He does a couple of other times but not as much as we see in this one. Um, God's inclusive, not exclusive. So let's have a look at that. He says there will be a house of prayer for all nations. So a house of prayer for Waihi, Beach, Waihi, Kari Kari, Haro, this part of the Bay of Mani. Is that right? Yeah. So that's inclusive, isn't it? And then it goes beyond for all nations. So therefore, he wants his house, his church, to be prayerful for the nations of the world. That's inclusive. Let me show you some other inclusive statements that are very, very clear. Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's inclusive. That's beyond where you live. It's beyond your address. It's the earth. So, even in teaching us to pray, he was teaching us to be inclusive. That was in, uh, of course, the, the Lord's Prayer. Acts 1 8, he says, uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll be my witnesses where? Here in Jerusalem. Where? Judea, Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the world. And when he said that, there's no further place away from him when he said that than here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Is that right? So, inclusive language is used by, where else? When he said the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. That's inclusive language. Amen? Um, and plant church is obviously as part of that. It's not here or there. It's here and there. God wants us to have 
inclusivity in our heart for here and there. And not just, you know, one pastor sent an email out from, he sent it to a friend of mine that went out and obviously a lot of people, my friend passed it on to me and there's some really good things about COVID in it, really good things that advice to churches. But you know what he did? And then he said, hey, maybe it's time we forget about helping Africa and we just help ourselves in our own communities and our own city. And I thought, oh, he's missing it. I'm not going to, this friend, this friend of mine said, do you think we should send that on to the pastors? And I'm like, oh no. Even though it's seven out of eight good points, I'm not going to send anything that's going to say, no, forget about Africa. Do you know the moment that those countries hit lockdown, 90% of those people, their income stopped. They didn't have a government like ours, generous to help. They didn't have wage extensions and subsidies and business stuff. They had nothing. No safety net. Their income stopped. So did their money to buy food and necessities for their families. So we chose to give more to missions during that time. We sent more to help. And it wasn't because people were pleading with us. We knew when we made, this, we made inquiries, we knew that the people that we had been involved with, and Gary's been, Jerry, Joy's been with Gary to some of those places, we knew that their income stopped the moment they had lockdown. They didn't have that opportunity to, to earn or get help from the government. And, um, and so, and plus we also gave thousands of dollars of pack and save vouchers out locally. What is it? Here and there. Not here or there. We need to be inclusive. We need to have a heart that reflects the heart of God for peoples of all nations. Not just our little part of the world, as it were. It has to be, obviously, that's where most of our time and energy goes into. But I want to encourage you this morning. I want to challenge you this morning about this area of carrying on, having this heart of missions for the nations, to develop that even more. The prodigal son story. Here's a take on it that maybe you haven't seen, unless you're Jewish. If you're Jewish, you've probably got it. The older brother is like Israel, not welcoming the Gentile sinners, the younger brother, seeking a way into God's family. And the prodigal son's story is a reminder to Israel to be faithful to the Abrahamic covenant. And when Jesus said that, the Jewish people can interpret it like that. You and I see it in a different way, and it's a fantastic story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Prodigal son's just amazing. I love the prodigal son. Yeah. I mean, I can preach eight things out of the prodigal son story. It can be all about the older brother. It can be about the younger brother. It can be about the father. It can be all these different things, and they're all true. Yeah. But for Jewish people, they realize that Jesus was talking to them about the failure around the Abrahamic covenant as well. Not just that personal level. Okay. So, you are the house of God. And you and I need to be faithful in prayer and giving and going when we get the chance, even with the gospel. Supporting missionaries. Amen? Yes. Praying for them and for the nations. Yes. Um, obtaining that inheritance that we have as churches. And God promises churches and us as, as individuals as well. In Psalm 2, in verse 8, he says, Ask of me, and I will give the nations as your inheritance, the, the ends of the earth as your possession. That was actually spoken uh, to the Messiah, to Jesus, but to us as the church. Okay. And this verse, this is a beautiful verse. Uh, let's turn there in Romans 10, um, verse We'll start, we'll probably start in verse 9. We might try and skip some of it. But Romans 10. This is about faith and it's about the gospel and the, the you know the our feet, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth 
that you profess your faith and are saved. The scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord who has believed our message. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I, I, I asked, did they not hear? Of course they did. Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Freedom Church in Waikiki Beach has a voice to the nations. Amen. You need to believe that. Freedom Church has a voice to the nations. As much as a church is engaging in missions beyond their own location, they have a voice to the nations. It might be a small voice, it might be a louder voice, but whatever it is, it's a voice. The moment you start praying, the moment you start giving, the moment you start partnering with men and women of God who have given up a lot to go into the mission field, or with national workers in those countries, you partner with those, then you have a voice to that nation. That's your voice. Heaven records that voice. Heaven rewards that voice. Amen? Amen? And so I want to encourage Freedom Church this morning, as much as they are right now, to even accept the challenge this morning. Hallelujah. You have a voice. I want to tie this in with uh, something that is probably, uh, uh, we're quite aware of at the moment. We're aware of some sort of uh, awareness around end times things at the moment because of what's been happening and uh, lots of conspiracy theories. I'm not going into those this morning, don't worry. But just turn with me to Matthew 24. I'm just tying these things together. Matthew 24. Matthew 24 and verse 14. And Jesus said this, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So Jesus put the context of his return, the end times, the context of his return into what? Into the gospel going to all nations, and then the end will come. Okay, so we've got 24,000 distinct people groups in the world, and many of those have been reached. So this, it's gone down very rapidly, even over the last 40 years, it's gone down rapidly, those that have now received the testimony, as it says there. It's right down to about 2,000 people groups that have yet to receive the testimony of the gospel in their own language with their self-propagating churches. Now, that's great progress. What does that tell you? If Jesus said, the end will come when all nations have received the testimony, and we've gone down from 24,000 24, total distinct people groups, nations it talks about, right down to 2,000. What does that tell you? It's pretty close. What does the church need to do? Continue getting the gospel to the nations. Continue fulfilling the Great Commission. And that is the indicator that Jesus gives you. That, so I know he's not coming back tonight. You say, Pastor, he could come back anytime. Friend, he's already said when he's coming back. He just hasn't given you the hour and the day because only the Father knows that. Is that right? But he's given us the context. And the context is when we get the work done, he will return. Yeah. It's not fear for people not to hear the gospel, is it? No. It's not fear. No one should hear it twice till everyone's heard it once. Yeah? yeah? No one should hear it twice till everyone's heard it once. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So, it's quite quiet. It's good. <laughs> I want to tie this up and try and encourage you with this, is that missions help speed his return. Amen? Yeah. And now I'll turn over another scripture where you can also help the Lord return faster to Peter 
chapter 3, verse 10. This is another one. I've studied the scriptures now for 46, 7 years, whatever it is, and I there's only two things that I've seen that can affect the, the return of the Lord and speed it up, as it were. And uh, 2 Peter is one of them, and the one that we've just said out of Matthew 24. So 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with the roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. So it's, it's not destroyed the earth. It's going to be renewed. Verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? It says you ought to live holy and godly lives. As you look forward to the day of God and it says speed it's coming. Wow. Wow. We can affect the return of the Lord in two ways. The only ways that I've seen in Scripture after studying them for over 40 years. And that is missions. Get the gospel to the nations, to the peoples. And to live godly, holy lives. To be the bride of Christ. The bride has made herself ready. It's a picture of the bride. It's a picture of Christians taking seriously God's number one goal in our lives is us to become like Jesus, to be conformed to his image. So we're growing in maturity. And here it says we can speed his coming as the church, as Christians become more godly as they live holy lives in a very unholy world. Is that right? The bride is getting herself ready. I want to tie this into uh, some of the circumstances in which we live. Um, and so... Even in, just write this down, we won't turn there, but 2 Peter 1 verse 3 says, we have been given divine power to live a godly life. Amen? So it's telling us to live a godly life and speed his return, but then the Bible also promises divine power to do that. Hallelujah? The bride is getting herself ready. Um, men don't really like the idea of being the bride of Christ. Let's face it. We're, we're not, we're blokes. We're men. We don't. What do you mean we're the bride of Christ? Well, that's the language of Scripture. So we could go with other things, you know, there's, that we're becoming mature sons. Is that right? That's another way of describing it. Uh, we're growing to be more Christ-like. But it's the same thought that we are growing in Christ-likeness and we're getting uh, closer to being a, a, a genuine reflection. Who believes that this area, this part of the Bay of Plenty, in this area, and this heart that you've got for beyond even the beach, who, who believes they deserve a genuine reflection of who Jesus really is? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A genuine, like, when they see us and when they see the church and they see Christians. Not perfect, but something genuine about Jesus that shines through yeah. the church and through our lives. And I believe that's our goal and, and where we are serving the Lord in, uh, in Glen Innes. Unfortunately, there's incredible evil and corruption pain and violence. Is that right? No. Right now. Selfishness. But the Bible says that will be finally dealt with when Jesus returns. Ooh. Who's looking forward to that? Yeah. It'll be finally dealt with Ooh. when Jesus returns. And Matthew, we won't turn there for the sake of time, but Matthew 13, and if you're writing it down, 36 to 43, it talks about the, the tears and the wheat. Okay? And Jesus talks about a parable and he says, let the tears and the wheat grow up together. Let them come to full maturity. We are in a day where full evil is coming to maturity. Is that right? Yeah. But Jesus is calling the church to full maturity, the wheat. And it's going to be separated, isn't it? The wheat, the church will go. Uh, it's come to maturity. It will go to be with God for eternity with the Lord. But the tears will be separated off. And that's the full evil that we see is maturing to this day. I want to ask you this question and, 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 you know, just say this thought. Do you think that allowing a baby to be uh, come to full term and leaving it on a table to die without medical assistance, do you not believe that's evil come to full term? That's evil come to full maturity. But see, we live in the, it's a proverbial bowl warming up, the water's warming up and the frog doesn't know, but he's getting boiled to death. Is that right? So evil is coming to full maturity 
And we're at a point now in our society where they are saying evil is good and good is evil. Yeah. You're right there. Is that right? Yeah. You ask Joy what she has to face in, a, in working in a school. Some of you others in the education system. Yeah. And it's just in their face every single day. Mm. So what, what, what we're in a day now is where evil is. The tears are coming to full maturity. But the church has to come to full maturity. Amen? Right. Yes. Um, and, and I know that in your kingdom now we can, we can say, yes, we have to do our utmost. And of course we do to bring kin kingdom influence. And I've just lost a friend from as an MP who's, when I say I lost him, he was an MP doing amazing work in Parliament, Alfred Nutter. So in that political space, he was bringing great kingdom influence. But because of that uh, red tide that happened, he lost his seat in Teatitu, and he's lost his voice in the parliamentary setting. He won't lose his voice overall, because he was already had a voice before he entered the Parliament. But we understand that some of those things that are happening right now, and we need to be kingdom influencers wherever we find ourselves. Is that right? So it's not a... It's not a despair. It's not a giving up of our hands. It should incentivize us. It should motivate us to do even more for the kingdom. Amen? Because the days, as the Bible says, the days are evil. And we need to understand that. Not be like that frog slowly boiled. Yeah? yeah not realizing, hey, those are tears. Those evidences are the tears growing to full maturity. T-A-R-E-S. Ephesians 5.16 says, Redeem the time. Make most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Turn with me to the last uh, chapter there in the Bible. Um, and we come to Revelation chapter 22. And we see this one, 12. We'll read it first from verse 12. Look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I'll give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the great gates into the city. Outside of the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the, and the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. And let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the waters of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds to any of the, anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in the scroll if anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy god will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and in the holy city which which i described in the scroll he who testifies to these things says yes i am coming soon amen come lord jesus the grace of the lord jesus be with god's people amen, amen. and now in some of your translations it uses the word maranatha everyone say maranatha and all it means is, it's like a cry. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, come. And when we were, when you were, when you came to the Lord in the hippie days, back in the 60s, you know, Maranatha was like a common, I think it was a song or a group. A group. Is that right? And so we were very familiar with that word Maranatha, but you don't see it much now. But Maranatha means, come, Lord Jesus. And here's what I want to ask you. Where's your Maranatha gone? Where has your Maranatha gone? Friends, there is enough resources in all the countries of the world to feed this planet, to feed all the peoples of this planet many times over, to have a surplus. I've had the privilege of going to ministering in nearly 50 of those countries and there's lots and lots of resources in those countries. But corruption and evil has taken those and not let them get to the normal everyday people. Yeah. There's enough for everybody. More than enough for everybody. It's corruption and evil. And therefore I say, Maranatha. Maranatha. Come Lord Jesus. We've got to do our best as the church to get the gospel. We've got to do our best as the church to bring kingdom influence into every of the seven mountains of the Lord into every sphere of society. But I, I believe that we need to find again a cry of Maranatha. 
How's your Maranatha? Have you got caught up with the corruption side of it? In the, in the sense of your focus and your despair? Or are you saying, like the Bible tells us to say, the spirit and the bride say come. Are you the bride? Sorry, men, are you the bride? You have to say yes. Men, you have to say yes. Reluctantly, yes. The spirit and the bride say, Maranatha, come. Is that in your heart? Is that in your heart? Would this, this morning, stimulate you to try and begin to cry out Maranatha more than you have been? Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. The pain and the suffering will finish. Amen? The lion will lay down with the lamb. There'll be no more tears. The only tears will be regret that we didn't do more when we had the chance. The only tears will be tears that we did not do more when we had the chance. Some tears of regret. And even then, they'll be, wiped, they'll be wiped away. Amen? As we come to a close this morning, I want to come and finish with the, from the meta-narrative to here. What about you? What about your part? Jesus says, occupy till I come. Not only be part of the meta-narrative, not only be part of the mission beyond this nation, not only be part of that cry of realizing, hey, as I grow closer to Jesus, as I be, live a godly life, I can speed the return of the Lord. As I am involved in mission as an individual, as a church, I can speed the return of the Lord. And then I can have that cry, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. But Jesus is talking about us occupying. Amen? That means now, that means here, that means in Waihi Beach, that means in this part of the Bay of Plenty where you have vision for. We have already started the launch out into Kadike, which is fantastic. Really, really fantastic. And it's part of the vision and the visionary leadership that you have as a church. And I just really want to encourage you to be a part of that. Make that a priority. How can I help? How can I put my gift, my talent, my resources to reach not only the beach but beyond to Waihi and beyond to Kati Kati and Pairo and wherever else the church would be led by the Holy Spirit. You have something that needs to be multiplied. You have something happening here that's obviously of God that needs to be multiplied into other communities. You need to realize that. You need to be not proud in the good sense, you know, not in the bad sense, but in the really good sense. You've got something that's wonderful to be multiplied. My friend Nick Klinkenberg, who you have now and again, and Nick and Karen are very close with Glenn and I, and, and we get together all the time. And uh, he loves it. He just loves what God is doing here. And we talk about it on the phone. And I told him, look, look, Nick, I'm coming. I'll correct all the silly things you said last time. I'll bring the balance that, you know, the church does. So I want to encourage you to be part of what God is doing here and beyond, even in this region, this part of Aotearoa. Amen? It's both and, not either or. Hallelujah. And you might be thinking, as we finish, we're trying to. Uh, you might be thinking, well... What about, you know, where's the balance? You started off past talking about a balance. Well, I believe when Jesus promised us an abundant life, these priorities, these kingdom priorities, are part of abundant life. Jesus said your life does not consist of what you own. It's way beyond that. I've met people in countries that you would call poor, and in circumstances that they, sure, they had enough food, they had good shelter, they weren't wanting in that area. They have more abundant lives than people that I've met from Remura. They've got big bank accounts, but are very poor in their life. Amen? Jesus promised us an abundant life. As Glenn and I have committed ourselves to trying to live out these priorities imperfectly, we have had opportunities to go around the world four times, twice to take our, our grand youngest our grandchildren, grandsons, before they reached 12, when we had to pay full fare, 
That's the Scottish coming out, isn't it? We're both Scottish entries, correct? Before they had to pay full fare, we took them when they were 11. We've done that twice and two other trips. Now, the wonderful thing was, on one of them was a sabbatical. You're supposed to have sabbaticals after every... Two years. No, seven, sorry. <laughs> seven years. We had our first sabbatical uh, after 28 years of ministry. We went to 18 countries in 19 weeks. We ministered in 12 of them. The other six countries, Jesus just said, I think you'll like to go here. There's some neat stuff there. And what about over here? You've got some family over here. Would you like to go there? He wants to give us abundant life. He's not reluctant to bless you to do something that's just for you. Just for your joy, for your satisfaction. It's all in the context, though, of putting the kingdom of God first. Amen? Abundant life is putting God's kingdom first. Every aspect of your life coming under His Lordship. So that you can have lots of time to also minister and be with the grandchildren, be with the family. We, these two ladies are very fierce about their grandchildren. I use that word, know that song about the Lord's... How fierce is lovers? That's these two ladies. Here. We, are, we love our grandchildren. Is that right? So an abundant life means that there is time. He doesn't say, God doesn't say, oh no, you can't get on time. But no, no, abundant life is all of those things we've been talking about. Amen? And sometimes they get your focus a bit more than others. Is that right? And we understand that. So I want to encourage you this morning. God has given Glenda and I the opportunity to experience some remarkable things on the, around the world. But it's been in the context of just wanting to serve the Lord. Just wanting to do what God wants us to do. Amen? And then God says, well, how about this? Would you like to do this? And I tell you what, we have saved and we've had homestays. Homestays from different countries. A hundred of them over the years. All different countries of the world. That's helped us to save, to go around the world. And then God's brought amazing provision, incredible provision. And some of that we've realized as we sat there, we thought, God, you are not just providing for us to go and do mission in some of those countries. You are even providing for us to go to Scotland and find out about our ancestors and to stay at our clan castle near Inverness, the Davison clan castle. Go and visit the McLean clan castle on the Isle of Mull. You know, God provides. Amen? He promises an abundant life. Let's stand together. Just close your eyes and think about the themes we've tried to cover. The meta-narrative, the big picture of missions. The way that that can speed up the Lord's return our personal our corporate involvement how living a godly life how being the bride of Christ how becoming more mature, more like Jesus how that can speed the return of the Lord about having that cry in our hearts developing that cry if you haven't really had it Maranatha, come Lord Jesus I don't want I don't want that pain to continue in the lives of so many millions of people. I don't want that corruption to continue that robs people of the resources you placed in those nations. I don't want that terrible abortion of millions upon millions of babies to continue. I don't want that evil to be called good and good to be called evil any longer. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. We long for you to set up a, a new earth and a new heaven and where the righteousness reigns. Yes. Help us not to have too many regrets in that day, Lord. Help us to say imperfectly though we were, imperfect though we are, help us to say, Lord, we, we try to do our best. We try to be part of the answer, what you called us to. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, help me to be a part of 
what you want to do in this part of the Bay of Plenty. Yes. What you've entrusted to our church here. Help me to use my gifts and my talents to be a part of what you're doing. Thank you, Jesus. Help me to invest some of my resources into what you're wanting to do in this part of this beautiful nation. Thousands upon thousands and thousands of people still haven't heard a clear presentation of the gospel. Millions upon millions, even billions in the nations have not yet heard. Help us to do our part. Lord, help me to do my part. You give me the grace to do my part. And Lord, this morning we want to thank you that we can live an abundant life. As we have these kingdom priorities, we can enjoy our family and our friends. We can enjoy our recreation. We can enjoy all that you've given us in the, nat in the natural, in this beautiful part of the nation. Thank you for an abundant life. Thank you, Jesus. It goes beyond our possessions. It goes beyond our bank balance. Thank you for that joy. Thank you, Lord, for that fullness. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that will help us to live that abundant life.